your worship. And uh, I just kind of wanted to start. I have a lot of scripture I want to talk about this morning. Um, a lot of concepts I'd like to talk about. I, I venture to say that I'm going to teach on giving in a way that you've probably never heard of before. And you'll, you know, you'll make a determination on whether or not what I'm saying to you bears witness with your spirit. But what I wanted to ask you with this is, is that, so if I was going to ask you to give, because this has something kind of to do with where I'm going. If I was going to ask you one word to connect yourself to Abraham, now you're going to say the word that's not the word I'm looking for. But to be fair to you, the word you're going to say is probably the best word. Okay. So if I was going to ask somebody to give me one word for Abraham, give it to me. Israel. Israel. Okay. Well, that's interesting. That's yeah, you, you, absolutely. Israel came from Abraham, and that's a good word. There's no wrong word. I'm just looking for a specific word. Yes, I understand. I'm just looking for a specific word. Anybody else got a word? If I say Abraham, you think of one word. Faith. Faith. Is that what everybody wants to say? Faith. Okay. That's the best word you could possibly come up with, but it's still not the word. Father. 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 What? Father. Father. Father of the faith. All right. So, look, it's time for me to stop all this. Okay, and it's time for me just to tell y'all the word I'm looking for. Obedience is a great word. This is the word I'm looking for, and, it, and it's going to make sense, right? Promise. Come on, come on. I know that that's connected to Abraham in a whole lot of ways, all right? So now that we have this first little clue in there, now we have this gentleman's name, Moses. So if this is promise, then this is law. All right. So now that we have those two pieces of the puzzle together, I want you to know this, <laughs> that Jesus is interconnected to both of these things. And I got one word in my heart for Jesus connected to these two words. And I'm not going to try to make you come up with it. I'm just going to tell you, fulfilled. My Jesus fulfilled the promises of Abraham, and my Jesus fulfilled the law yes. of Moses. Amen? And I do want, because I'm talking about giving this morning, to go ahead and just put this number here, 430, because there's approximately 430 years that went from the promise before we got to the law. And in the New Testament, we're reminded that what was promised here can't be annulled by this right here because this right here came 430 years after this right here. All right. And so with all of that said, and we're talking about giving this morning and the title is give your worship. And again, I just want to make this clear. I believe that I'm going to talk about giving in a way that maybe you've never heard of before. And you know what? You may not completely agree with me on this today. And maybe you will agree with me on it next week or next year. And maybe you won't. And the good news is, is that it's okay. Either way you want to do with it, because I'm getting a newfound freedom in my understanding of what we're called to do in our interaction with one another. Amen. Our interaction with one another is this, and I got it written in my notes, so I'll try not to repeat it when I get to it, is that it's my job yes. to seek the face of God to hear his word that he desires for me to speak to you and for me to give you his word as he gives it to me. And it's your job to receive the word. You'll either believe that it's a word you want to receive or not because you're your own free will, mortal being, right? And you're, and you're going to make a decision. I receive this word for myself or you're going to make a decision. I reject this word for myself. And then what's going to happen is one day in the by and by, we're going to meet him in the sky. Hallelujah. All right. On the other side of the spiritual Jordan. And I'm going to stand before his face and I'm going to give an account. Hallelujah. Because it comes real, real to me for every word that I spoke to his people. And you're going to give an account for every word that you were given privy to. What you did with this work. Does that make sense? Is that fair that we, that we understand that? And I think it's important that we understand yes. that. That we will be held accountable yeah. for what we did with God's word. Is that, is that yes. true? Do you yep. believe? Do you, do, yep. Can we all agree on that? Can yes. we give me a little shake of the head? Because I just want to make sure that we're at least all in agreement on that. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. 
So I titled my message, Give Your Worship. And I just wanted to say a couple of things before we <clears throat> got going good, okay? First of all, I wanted to say thank you to all the believers in the house that faithfully bring their tithes and offerings into the storehouse of God. It is your communion and fellowship with the word of God that provides this place of worship for us to come together and worship our king in comfort. I am pers personally thankful for your joint participation with the Holy Spirit as he leads you in this form of your worship. And let there be no mistake. That is what it is. It is worship. Right. And for those that say you can't afford to worship God this way, I will remind you that you worshiped Bera, the king of Sodom, with your money when you were in the world. Now we're going to talk about that a little bit more. I thought about giving the microphone to Robert and letting him tell y'all his testimony of what the Lord showed him about giving his money to the, well, as a matter of fact, I mean, why don't we just go, you mind doing that, Rob, just real quick, just a real quick testimony of what the Lord showed about how he used to tithe, right? And you know, I don't know how much detail, Mike, I don't know how much detail you want to go into. Whenever, uh, well, from well, how the Lord showed you used to pay your tithes in the in the world, whatever, however you want to work. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, a lot of people don't know my whole story, but I uh, I was a drug dealer. I went through a bit of divorce, and um, probably most of my fault. But I ended up in strip clubs and throwing rave parties, uh, very big rave parties. And my life was turned into a party. Well, I used to say, Sabrina has been a friend of mine for about 30 years, and she used to laugh at me because, and she was already a Christian, but living in the world. But I used to say things like, I'm going to die in this club, you know, because I was on drugs, ecstasy, and all that stuff. But I used to say, the strip clubs was my temple. Mm -hmm. And I used to have no problem tithing in those temples. It wasn't a struggle. It wasn't, I just did it. Mm -hmm. And I have nothing to show for it today. Well, since I got saved, I earned, in a halfway house, I earned $6,000 before I came home. The Lord led me to a church. I went straight to the pastor when I got out and I asked the Lord, you know, if this is a church for me, do you want me to tithe? And I went straight to that pastor and said, here's my tithe. I've been led to your church through uh, certain circumstances while I was locked up and didn't even know I was going to be living in the home when I first got out. But I tithed in that church with those $6,000. And I can tell you that I've come, you know, the Lord has taken care of me since I've been home. Uh, my dad told me when I got home, he says, you need to have a tithe, you need to do this, you need to do that. I said, no, dad, I'm going to trust the Lord with my finances. And from that day forward, he has taken care of me. Now, don't get me wrong, there's hills, valleys, famines, but it's in those valleys and famines that you'll learn yeah. to trust the Lord yeah, with true. all things, even your finances. Yeah. And I can tell you, I've been in a famine for the last probably three months with my business, but there's been times where I've earned $6 million a year. Right. So I'm going to just let you know. Tithing yes. is yes. worship and it's important. Right. Praise yes. God. Yes. Thank yes. you. Yes. That was yes. I didn't have to I didn't have to cue you about that what I was looking for. Amen. Because yes. I remember him telling me that I was like, dude, that is so good the first yes. day he told me that. Um, he's like, man, I didn't have problems paying my tithe in the temple. That's right. And I think that that's one of the things, because you know, here's my little low level story, right? Because his step, his, he's like a little bit of higher, low on the ladder of crime. I can remember being in the grocery store whenever I was living in an apartment with some people that I was just like, anyway, and I was at the cash register and I had a roll of toilet paper and a four to, and a six pack of beer. And they're like, sir, you don't have enough money to buy both of these. And I was like, is it okay if I just leave the toilet paper right here? <laughs> So that's what I'm trying. I'm trying to make a point to you that 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 look. We, we somehow we found money back when we was in the yes. world. Yeah. All right. And I know I'm not talking to everybody here this morning because, like I said, some people have been very faithful, and I'm very grateful. But somehow or another, when we were in the world, we 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 found the money to do what it was that we wanted to do. And that's really where the rubber meets the road, I believe, when it comes to giving. So. 
Anyway, the enemy of your soul enticed our flesh to spend our money on ourselves in ways that we should not have. And now we have uh, more money in our pocket than we ever did before. Right. We should anyway. And somehow we can't give it to give it to God. And, and we're going to read it soon about that little story. I believe this, that we all going to have to come to this place where we're going to have to make a decision. So I also want you to know that my point is not to convince you of how much money you should pay. My point is not to convince you that you should pay 10% on the gross or the net. Whether we realize it or not, the children of Israel were required to bring more than 10%. And some commentators believe that after it's all added up, it's closer to 20 to 30%. And that's not including the temple tax that they were required to give in addition to the free will offerings that they wanted to give. When the Holy Spirit hit them in the book of Acts, they gave everything. And Ananias and Sapphira dropped dead on the spot. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. What is the point that I see in that? The point that I see in that is that something wasn't right in his heart. He, like, he, you understand what I'm saying? There was some kind of weird commotion going on in his heart where he was imagining that he was doing something okay, but he knew that he was manipulating the situation, he said, the money was yours. And Ananias, what were you, what were you thinking? What were you doing? And, and sometimes we do that, in, not just with money, but we do that in circumstances with our walk with God, right? We justify actions in our own heart and in our minds and because we want to do something the way that we want to do it. And it's like the whole time we're there. How do you know that, preacher? How do you know that I might do that? Because I know my own heart. And I know that I'm not the only one that, that we will create situations in our mind and we will justify our actions and we act like God isn't aware of what we're doing. You know what I'm saying? And I just want to encourage you. Let us remember that the Lord sees our heart and it's so important that in our heart we walk perfect before the Lord. And what I mean by perfect is that we keep it right with him. We keep it real with him. You don't have to come to me and to keep it right and real, but you must. By all means, you and the Lord keep it right and real between y'all because God sent his son to where we can. Amen. Amen. So really, um, more than anything, my assignment this morning is to draw a line from the Old Testament to the New Testament where we can clearly see that God is the same yesterday, today and forever. His heart for a congregation of worship in the old is the same heart for a congregation of worship in the new. The worship between he and his people required a house for him then. And it requires a house for him today. OK, and I, I, and I mean, this is the gospel. This is the word of God. And we're going to look at it. All right. And uh, I mean, so anyway, let's, let's just keep going. So I remember I wanted you to know that it's not my intent to convince you to believe what I believe. And, and, and again, when I first got saved, my pastor told me that I was supposed to pay tithes. And she told me that meant 10 percent. I'm just telling you all a little bit of my my story. And I'm just telling you what happened in me. I'm not telling you. I'm not over here to say you got a wicked heart. I'm telling you what happened in my wicked heart. <laughs> because my next, my next question was, what do you mean 10% on the gross or the net? <laughs> and this was her response. And she said, it depends on if you want a gross or a net blessing. Okay. So, yeah. So, so then, then I went to the elders in the church. And I'm like, well, this is what Sister Toot said. <laughs> Uh, you know, what you think about that? No, I didn't even tell them that. I, didn't, I said, hey, am I supposed to pay on the net or the gross? And their, their response was the same. It depends on if you want a net or a gross blessing. And so from there, uh, so, so, so the question is, you know, that's what they said. Do you want to, and so, but it's not my job to convince you of anything like that. I, it's not even my desire really to give you a number or anything like that. It's my job to study, pray, present his word. Amen. And then we're, we'll come to a conclusion. Also, another thing I want you to know is this, is that I'm not here to convince you that 
about me. I'm not preaching about me this morning or anything having to do with offerings connected to me. I will quickly mention a couple of scriptures, Luke 10 and 7. The laborer is worthy of his hire. 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially. Now, double honor, I mean, we could sit there and dig that out and see what we think that means. But this is the Apostle Paul writing this letter to to the church, and Apostle Paul made tents, and at the same time he's saying that that they were the double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. And then he says, for the scripture says you shall not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So one of the things, I, I, I'm not preaching about the pastor, the preacher, who gets the money, how the money is divided. I just want you to know that the scripture is clear that it is an it is it is a it is expected thing that the preacher, that the pastor does get paid for the work that he does. All right. And I don't think anybody has a problem with that. I just wanted to make sure we were clear on that. All right. So there is a word in the New Testament that I thought was interesting in some of my studies. And we're not going to go to all these Scriptures. I, we do download these notes on our website. Uh, you know, www. What dash on the AO Bible Study .com, All one word, and so all the notes are there. If you ever want the notes, I can make sure I get them to you because it's a lot of got a lot of notes this morning. But there's a word Corbin, and I think I mentioned it a while back. And this is a very interesting word. I don't want to get too deep in it, but come to find out as I was studying it a little deeper, that English translation, C-O-R-B-A-N, is actually a transliteration of a Hebrew word. So it's in the New Testament, but it's taken from the Hebrew because if you look at the word in the Hebrew, it's spelled Q-O-R-B-A-N, and it's a gift. And sometimes the Corbin gift was either a sacrifice that was a free will offering of the believer, or it could have been precious metals, silver, gold, right? And the whole idea of Corbin, if you looked at it, it means to bring something near to the altar. So it was a form of worship when they would bring the animals for sacrifice. They knew they were worshiping God when they would bring these articles. Look, in Numbers Chapter 7, if you want to read it later, verses 12 through 13, it lists through all of the ones that were bringing those. His cor his offering, Corbin, was this much uh, silver platter along with this much silver. And, and they just kept bringing it, kept bringing it, lines of them, bringing it, bringing it to the house of God. Okay, And so whether it was these animals or these precious metals, it was a form of worship to the Lord. So a couple of statements I wanted to make, and I'm, I was going to get y'all to repeat it, but I don't want you to repeat something that you might not be sure you agree with. So I'm just going to go ahead and read the statements to you, and I'm going to say, the tithe is for the Lord's house. That's right. I'm going to say it one more time. The tithe is for the Lord's house. You may not really care to study this out, but if you do study, you will see the tithe is for the Lord's house. I'm talking about the Lord's house. I'm not talking about, well, you got to determine whether or not you think the Crossway ministry is the Lord's house. I'm talking about the Lord's house. I'm talking about the Lord. Y'all understand where I'm coming again? No, when the Matt Abair's name is not on the paperwork, but I'm not even talking about this. I am talking about the local assembly, but I'm not really talking about the local assembly. I'm talking about the Lord's house. Y'all understand what I'm, I'm talking about? God is magnificent. He is mighty. He is full of majesty. And he is worthy to be worshipped. And he is worthy to have offerings brought to his altar. He is worthy to be recognized for who he is and, and what he's done. Yes. Hallelujah. The tithe is for the Lord's work. Let me say that again. The tithe is for the Lord's work. Now, there's a couple of questions I got. I don't bend up my microphone. Lord forgive me. <coughs> Here's a couple of questions. What is the Lord's work? What is the Lord's work? I, you know, I mean, I, I'm just going to throw these questions out there because I want you to think, right? What is the somehow, some way, the Lord's work is related to a lamb? Somehow, some way, the Lord's work is related to a sacrifice. Can we agree on that? All right. But I will say this, the Lord's work is getting you near. 
The offering comes near. The Lord's work on the big scheme of life is getting man near his heart. Does that make sense? Man, he, and now we, we can infer from the scriptures that God walked with Adam in the cool of the day. And when the fall took place, a division and a separation happened. And I can certainly not just infer, I can prove from the scriptures. It will take me time that God's business, God's work has been getting man near him, near to his heart. He's been in, and he's been working hard, my friend, through the annals of human history to get you to get me near him. So so the Lord's work is getting you near. How does he do that through a sacrifice? OK, how do you do that? You receive what he's doing. You agree with him and through faith you connect to him. Amen. And so what is your purpose? What is your purpose in this grand scheme? And I'm, I'm kind of trying to really narrow it down to one word concept. And I'm going to bring some scripture here in a moment. But, but what I want to ask, what is your purpose in all of this? You know what I'm saying? Like whenever we, I don't know, I'm not trying to be weird. But sometimes songs tell a story. And I can remember back whenever Danielle and I were dating that Michael W. Smith came out with a song. And, and I was singing it the other day in the, in the kitchen. And, and, you know, but it's uh, looking for the reason. <laughs> yeah. To, my place in this world, my place in the, you get the point, my place in this world. Isn't that the heart of most humanity? What is my purpose here? Oh, what, what, am, I, what am I doing here? What is, my, what is my place in this world? So what, I want, what I'm bringing, breaking it down to is a very simple phrase for you. What is your purpose? I'm here to tell you your purpose is to serve him. <laughs> your whole purpose is to serve him. And whether it's whether we're going to use the word ministry, but ministry can be broken down in a whole lot of different ways. When it all gets down to you're going to serve him through worship and whatever the definition of worship is, whether we just believe it's a song service, I can tell you right now, it is not just a song service. It is your life. Amen. Worship is your life. Servanthood is your life. Amen. And we can bring in a New Testament scripture right now. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. If you are a true believer, you do not belong to yourself. And you and I have to understand what God is speaking through his word. And we have to come to grips with the reality that we are not our own. And that he is God in heaven. He is the potter. We are the clay. And he is molding us. And the question is, will we allow his his beautiful hands to mold us into what he wants us to be, even whenever sometimes we don't like the way he does it. All right. Whose table is? It? That's a good question. He said, bring your tithe and offering into the storehouse that there might be meat on my table. So whose table is? It? Not Pastor Matt's table. Now, in the Word of God, in the Old Testament, there's provision for the poor, there's provision for the worshiper, there's provision for the priests. Okay, I want you to know there's provision in all of that. But I'm asking you, whose table is it? It's the Lord's table. And whose food is it? Boy, that's whenever it gets real tricky. Okay, and because, well, I mean, the Levites had to give a tithe of the tithe so that the priests, by the way, let me... Let's make this a little bit kind of like a Bible study, too, while we're at it, like a little Sunday school lesson. <laughs> okay, so Abraham had a grandson, and his grandson had 12. That's where the 12 tribes came from, right? right. Jacob's name was changed to Israel, right? Y'all remember that? All right, I'm not trying to get too technical, but I want us to follow along. So Jacob's offspring, with, with the children that he had... The fourth one was Judah, and we know who comes from Judah, Jesus, hallelujah, the king tribe, right? But the third one was Levi. All right, so Levi was the third child of Leah and Jacob. And from Levi, 430 years later, there was a man named Moses. I mean, and he had a sister named Mary, and we'll mention her. We don't want to leave the ladies out. Moses, his sister Miriam. And who else? Aaron. Why does that matter? Because that's just, I'm just trying to help you get a little understanding of the Bible so that when you read it, maybe you'll understand it a little bit better. So now we have 430 years of reproduction of these different tribes, and there's no even telling how many countless thousands of, Le of Levites we have now. 
by the time that they actually leave Egypt and get ready to move towards the promised land. Thousands and thousands. We can find it in the book of Numbers how many there were, but I just don't know off the top of my head. And the Levites were in charge of all the temple work. But not every Levite was a priest because the priest came from Aaron. And so all the tithes and the offerings were brought to the Levites. And out of the tithes and offerings brought to the Levites, another tithe they had to tithe went specifically to the priests. So that the priests could eat and but the work, you see what I'm saying? The Levites were in charge of the work of the house of God. The Levites were in charge of the worship that took place in the house of God. And I don't want to lose you in all of the information, so I want to make sure that we understand that the worship of the house of God was directly related to what? Daily sacrificial offerings over and over and over again. And I have it in my message, but we've already preached it a couple of weeks ago. We come to the conclusion, a body you have prepared for me. Because all of those sacrifices and all of that sweet smelling aroma pointed to Jesus who is the only way that we can be brought near, who is the only one that is worthy of worship, who in the big plan of God, it's all mapped out. It's all there. But one of our problems as people of God is this. We so often are so focused on ourselves We're so focused on ourselves and may your blessing be upon and a thousand. Yeah, I love that song. Good, I love that blessing. <laughs> by the way. So I'm not being sassy. Let his face turn towards you. You understand what I'm saying? And was, That's right. Let me sing that song. Turn your face towards me, Lord. And, and the Lord was like, yep, turn your face towards me, son. Put your face on me. Put your mind on me. Put your connect with me to my work. Listen, I didn't have this, but look at his scripture where he says in Matthew, he says this. He says, look at the lilies. They neither spin nor toil. And Solomon arrayed in all of his splendor. Didn't look anything like one of them. He said, the birds, they never, they don't sow nor reap. Your heavenly father makes sure that they're taken care of. Take no need or thought for tomorrow. You're worried about what the clothes you're going to wear, the food you're going to eat. He said this. This is Jesus. Jesus said this. The Gentiles worry about that. Well, what did he mean by that? Well, what did he mean by that, Lord? That word Gentile. What did I mean by that? People that don't know God worry about that stuff. But no, but you're not a Gentile. You're a child of the living God. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these other things shall be added unto you. So what my main emphasis of this message is to prove to you from the scripture that tithes and offerings is all part of a worship for the kingdom of God, for the worship of God, that the lamb would be exalted, that the lamb would receive his glory, his honor, his due, because every page I turn and almost every sentence that I read, I see it keep on pot. It's all about him. It has pleased the father to lay all principality, all power under his feet. The father is, receives his glory and his honor whenever we worship the son and one day you and I are going to step into an eternity and this temporary is going to be over and what we did on this side of eternity is going to have an effect on what we step into. Amen. Amen. All right. So this is another thing that I've, and listen, I've, I've said this before too. Uh, I pay my tithes where I get fed. Right? Y'all have y'all ever said that? You don't have to shake your head. <laughs> it's okay. 
I know many of you have said because I've heard some of you say that. Because we've all said it. I pay my tithes where I get fed. But, but I want to make this point again. I want to ask, whose house is it? It's the Lord's house. Whose table is it? The Lord's table. Whose food is it? Boy, this is going to be interesting when we get into some of these scriptures. Whose food is it? Well, I would have thought it was the priest. No, 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 no. It's the Lord's food. And so who's supposed to be getting fed? I'm trying to say the Lord's supposed to be getting fed. And so it ain't about you and where you get fed. No, you need to understand this. What I'm trying to tell you, I believe this to be true or else I wouldn't be saying it. It's not about you or where you think that you're going to get fed. The question is, is the Lord getting fed? And the question is, what has God called you to do as part of that process and where you are supposed to be? Because even if we had a visitor here this morning, I'd say, keep on shopping, my friend, until you find the place that you believe is suited for you. And when you get there, hunker down. Don't let yourself get easily offended. Okay, and give to the work of God if you believe it is indeed the work of God. Amen. But it's not about where you get fed, and we're going to get into it in the scripture. It's about the Lord getting fed. Because again, it's his house, it's his table, it's his food, and it's his mealtime. And how he gets fed, and I'm going to show it to you in the scripture, is that a body he has prepared for him. Offering and sacrifice you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. And whenever you see it, we're going to get into it, but when you see it, it's like the, the sacrifices, the sacrifices over and over again. And it was just, it would be, you know what? It was because it was never, his appetite was never full. Oh man, that is so good. I put it on my phone. You can't read it, but it comes out in Numbers 29. I wrote the whole thing. The Father's food is the sacrifice of Jesus. In Numbers, the sacrifices kept coming. As humans, we eat until we are satisfied. God kept on eating because he was never satisfied because the blood of bulls and goats could not satisfy. But once Jesus offered his life as a sacrifice, the Father quit eating. Hallelujah, Jesus was done. Jesus sat down at the right hand of the throne. No more sacrifices. No more of this. Now it's all turned back to Jesus. All the worship of the true fulfillment of the sacrifice. Give him his glory. Give him his honor. Find yourself a church where the worship exalts the lamb. Find yourself a church where the preacher exalts the lamb. And give to the work of God so that he can be fed. You are holy, Father. And Je Jesus, you are holy. And you deserve your honor. And you deserve your glory. Find yourself a place that's willing to do that. Yes, amen. And pour yourself into that. Amen? amen. Wherever that is, pour yourself into that. And I believe that to be the way that you can please the Lord. All right, let's look at some scriptures here. Genesis uh, comes out of Genesis 14. I'm not even going to tell you the scripture, but I'm going to turn yet to scriptures. And I want to just share. I'm out of breath, man. I need to get back up. Do a little bit more jogging. Hallelujah. You're to preach a little more quiet with the other. Yeah. Take that out. <laughs> so this is the story of Abraham. And we know the story of his nephew Lot. Lot made some bad mistakes, right? Lot made decisions based upon what he saw in his physical senses. He's a shepherd. He looked at the plain of the Jordan. He said it's well watered. He's a shepherd. It makes sense. Green grass, water, logical determination, right? The natural mind cannot perceive the things of God. They are spiritually understood. We know the story. Lot ends up pitching his tent towards Sodom. Next thing you know, he's at the gates of the city, which is where commerce is done. The next thing you know, he's in the city, and we know the story. He gets taken captive by kings of the world, and Abraham, with 318 servants, goes and fights against the five kings. And two of the kings in there, one of them was named Bera, the king of Sodom. Because, see, his kingdom was taken and Lot was taken in the midst of the skirmish. Now, you can't make this stuff up. But if you look up the word Bera in the Hebrew, it means, the, it means evil one. You can't make it up. 
It, it was written in there thousands of years ago. All right. And so after the victory, it's obvious that Abraham did not beat these people up by himself. He had 318 servants. So the Bible says that he shows up in the king's valley. I need you to understand that every human being that has ever lived and breathed upon the earth will end up in the king's valley one day. That's right. It's a valley of decision. And the question is, who will you serve? Because you see, the king of Sodom came to meet him out there. His name is Vera, evil one. The king of the evil one showed up. And then all of a sudden, this man, we're going to put it under Abraham, <coughs> Mel. Is a deck. I know, that's a big old word. Most people that have been in church for a while have at least heard the name. Some people have never heard the name. Very, very interesting character. Very important interconnected to tithing because this is the first tithe that ever took place in the Bible. So Sodom, the king of Sodom, the evil one, comes to Abraham, but so does Melchizedek. We're going to read in Hebrews chapter 7 some passages of scripture, but just let's go ahead and break this down. By the translation of his name, he is the king of righteousness. Melk king Zedek righteous. By the translation of his name, he is the king of righteousness. By the rulership of what he ruled over Salem, which was ancient Jerusalem, which is the city of peace, he is the king of Peace, And he is priest of God most high. See, that's why the psalmist said in Psalm chapter Psalm 110 that you are God will not repent. You are a priest after the order of Melchizedek. God is not going to change his mind. And listen, it's all worded out in Hebrews chapter 7. But why would God have to create a whole different priesthood? Why couldn't he come from Aaron? Because Aaron's priesthood, they were already sinful and had to offer sacrifices for their own self. So they could not be the fulfillment of the eternal priesthood. And not only that, Jesus is a king priest. Melchizedek was a king priest. All right, hold on on Melchizedek for a second. But what I want you to know is this. Melchizedek came out offering something to Abraham. Do y'all remember what Melchizedek offered Abraham? Bread and wine. What? How does this even happen? <laughs> Are you serious? Thousands of years ago, the king of righteousness, the king of peace, the priest of God most high comes offering bread and wine to Abraham, the recipient of the promise that was fulfilled in Jesus. And then the king of Sodom comes to him and says, you keep the money, give me the souls. You keep the money. I just want the people because I need some slaves for my kingdom. <clears throat> and each human being is going to make a determination in life. Who's going to be their king? Amen. And the Bible says that Abraham gave him Melchizedek, a tenth of the spoil, because somehow he had spiritual revelation that he did not win this battle on his own. And he told Bera, the, the king of Sodom, he said, I'm not giving you anything. Because if I gave you something, you'd turn around and say, Abraham was blessed. Because I, he said, I ain't doing no. I mean, I'm just saying, I'm putting words in his mouth now. But basically, he's saying, I'm not doing no deal with the king of the world. And it actually says this in Deuteronomy. Uh, the scripture in Deuteronomy says, beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. And I'm here to tell you something. Some of the most powerful, richest men in the world have tapped into a true, a, a spiritual truth. That if you give to the needy, you will get back to you. It's a spiritual law. But just because people are given to get back doesn't mean that it's, that it's God's will. What are you trying to say? I'm trying to make a point. 
I can't remember the men's name, so if I'm misquoting, I'm not doing it on purpose. Let me just say that. People like Warren Buffett, people like Zig Ziglar, people like this who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ have received an understanding that not only do they get a tax break if they give money to charitable organizations, they get more money given back to them. It's a spiritual principle that takes place. Yes. They're not working towards the kingdom of God. They're working for their own self. They're saying, if I give, I get. And many times, while it is true, where the Lord says, test me in this. Yes. And see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you cannot contain. And the truth of sowing and reaping is there. For if you will sow a seed, you will reap a harvest. And even in the midst of all that, God's people, if they're not careful, can allow covetousness to enter into their heart. And they will begin to give in order to get back. And they will begin to say, it's about where I get fed. <laughs> And I'm going to give to where I want to give. And that's between you and the Lord if you still believe that that's your, what, what the scripture is talking about once we're done with all of these scriptures. And it's okay you're able to believe that. But what I got a revelation of after all this is that no, it's all about him. It's all about him. It's all about his kingdom. And it's all about his will and what he desires and the truth that he desires to reveal. It, it's all about him. It's all about his Jesus. It's all about us serving him. So let's go ahead and take a look at this Hebrews chapter 7 passage. Uh, we'll start in verse 1. And I'm just going to read through because it's just further commentary on what we just talked about. But it's got a little bit of added information in it. <laughs> it says, for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God. I'm in the ESV. I don't know if that's what you're in or not. I'm in the ESV. Priest of the Most High God met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, which means king of peace. Look at this. He is without father or mother or genealogy. Man, I spent hours on this. What I need you to understand is that the Bible's telling you, you don't know who his mom is, you don't know who his daddy is. He showed up one day and he, you were told who he was and, there's, and he is a type of Jesus who is an eternal priest. That's what we need to understand. You start digging too deep, you, you may not come back. Okay, I'm just, I'm just warning. Just stick to the script. He, doesn't, he has neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the son of God, he continues a priest forever. Amen. See how great this man was to whom Abraham, the patriarch, the one that was given the promise, gave a tenth to the spoils of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people that is from their brothers Though these are descended from Abraham. So what does that mean? Just try to stick with me through the informational stuff. Levi is where the priests, the priests came from. But look, how many other brothers were there? I mean, there was Issachar, there was Ephraim, there was Judah, there was Reuben, there was Simeon. There was all these different brothers. And they all, as the tribes multiplied into thousands and thousands, had to bring their tithes and their offerings into the house of God. And so, and so he's, he's trying to make a point that Levi, Levi, during the time frame of the law, because it was the descendants of Levi, during the time frame of the law, were receiving these tithes and offerings from their brothers. But this man, who does not have descent from them, received tithes from Abraham. You see... It's so important that we understand that the promise was given to Abraham before the law ever was. The promise of justification by faith was given to Abraham before the law ever was. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of these truths. If God would have only wanted the tithe to be part of the law, then why would he institute it before the law ever came? It's just a good thought to think about. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In other words, spiritually, 
the, the superior one blesses the inferior one. What does that mean? Melchizedek was superior spiritually than Abraham was because he's the one that gave the blessing. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men. But look at this. This is what I wanted you to see because this was profound to me right here. Verse 8. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, meaning the descendants of Levi are receiving the physical tithes. But look at this. But in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. And so I want to make this clear. And you may already know this. When you give your tithes and offerings to the house of God, you are not paying your tithes to the law. You're not paying your tithes to Pastor Matt. You are paying your tithes to the living one. You are paying your tithes to Jesus Christ, the resurrected one. You are giving your, what you, what you have been given. Now, now listen, I haven't got into this yet, but the tithe is not yours anyway. It's important that you know that. It's important that you understand that the scripture is clear. The tithe, just like your life doesn't belong to you, the tithe, listen to me, the tenth does not belong to you. Let me make it clear. You cannot do with it what you want to. No, you can do whatever you want. You are a free will human being. You can make your own decisions with your life, with your job, with your finances, with your tithe. But according to the word of God, your life is not your own and the tithe is not your own. God says the tithe belongs to me. Now I can tell you, I did not like that whenever that preacher told me that I had to pay my 10%. And I'm like, well, what if I'm late on it? She said, yeah, a fifth. I'm like, what? It's in there. Now, whether or not you agree with that or not, I'm just telling you what she told me. Yeah, a fifth to it, brother. That's right, because see, it's the first fruits. You don't hold on to it and barter with the Lord's money. No, no, no. Listen, I'll venture to say this ain't nothing other than just kind of share testimony. I could be wrong. Lord, forgive me if I'm wrong. Danielle would have to be my witness. I don't believe we ever missed a tithe check since I've been married. Praise God. I don't believe that we ever purposely held on to a tithe check. I'm just trying to, what is my, and I told her this morning, she didn't even know why I was saying that because she didn't know what my mess I thought I told her she was saying something else about something, you know, me. I don't remember letting nobody know. I'm like, I'm like, all I know is this. After 37 years, I wish I would have gave more. I wish I would have gave more. I know I've given more than what was required of me. I, I believe I did. If I had to calculate it out on paper, I believe in some way, shape, or form, I gave more than what the tenth was, but I wish I would have given more. You understand what I'm saying? You can't outgive him. You can't outgive him. And I'm not saying it for covenant pur purposes. I don't care if I ever have a bigger house. I don't care if I have a car with an air conditioner. Hallelujah, that car held up for three years. I do not care. I thank God that he ain't sitting on no air conditioner <laughs> on Johnson Street. Hallelujah. All right. Here we go. Regarding Abraham's statement to Bera, we already went there. All right. So in Exodus chapter 8, I want you to know this too. That the whole conflict with Pharaoh was all about God receiving his worship. I don't really have time to go through all the scripture, but it's something you can study. Exodus 1 talks about it. You go tell Pharaoh, let my people go so that they can serve me. And if you look in the original language, the word serve means to do the work of the worshiper. Then he says in, in Exodus chapter 8, there, where the conflict is, Pharaoh's like, well, you can go offer the sacrifices. Oh, so here we go. What is the worship? What is the serving? The sacrifice. I want sacri I want my worship, he says. Let my people go. Let my congregation go so that they might worship me. You are the congregation of God. He's saying to the evil one, let my people go so that they can have freedom and liberty to worship me. Sometimes God's people are all wrapped up and cleaned up. The vines of the world, the vines of sin, hold them down. They can't even lift their hands up. I'm here to tell you, you can't buy freedom from the Lord with your checkbook, but I'm here to tell you that if you'll worship Him, if you will serve Him, if you will seek first the kingdom of God and His right. 
righteousness, he will rip them vines of lies off of you. And you will be lifting your hands into the sky to give him glory. Yeah. To give him honor. Because he's the one that's worthy. I can't say that enough because I don't think y'all believe me. No, I think you believe me that he's worthy. For some reason, I don't think you believe that that's really my opinion here. I'm here to tell you that Jesus is worthy. He is the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth. Let all the nations laud him. Open up your head, O ye gates. Open up your everlasting doors. And the king of glory will come in. Who is this king of glory? He is the Lord, strong and mighty. He is the Lord. He's mighty in battle. He is worthy to receive his glory and his honor. He's going, somebody going to give it to him. It'll either be you and me or somebody else down the street is going to give it to him. And if not, then the rocks will cry out. Yes, but he's going to get his glory. And I want to, I want to encourage you. Start giving it to him, my friend. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So that was the whole conflict of the deal with Pharaoh, all the plagues, the death of the firstborn. God said, let my people go so that they can worship me. But the world don't want to let you go easy, my friend. No. Pharaoh, the devil, doesn't want to let you go easy. And, and, and it is a good question. What are we going to do? Are we going to let him win? Because this is the thing. That's exactly what we do when we don't let God have his way in our lives. We're letting the devil win because Jesus already paid the price to set us free. It's a done deal. Jesus said it is finished. He already defeated principalities and powers. It's, listen, now that we have all this revelation and understanding of the new covenant and we understand that Jesus already won the victory, it's time for us to stand up and it's time for us to, get to, to walk in victory. I believe. Amen? All right. Praise God. <laughs> so look at this. Exodus chapter 12. Let's read this one. Exodus 12 verses 35 through 36. God commands the blessing on his people for the purpose that they can give to his word. Listen, way back a long time ago, the Lord opened up doors of prosperity for me. It's a long story. I've probably shared it before. Well, I'm going to just say this. I was in prayer for a new contract here. And I said, Lord, give me wisdom from heaven on how to negotiate this contract. It came just immediately as soon as I said it. Tell them to compare your numbers to theirs. It changed everything. I did it with all humility. I, I, if you would have had to have been there to see how I said it, I said it with all humility. But I said what I told him was, please do me a favor and compare my numbers to y'all's numbers. Your numbers are not my business. You don't have to show me my numbers. I'm just asking you to compare them because now you charge for my services. I'm not a liability. I'm an asset because I got a new degree. And it changed everything. That's right. Okay. And when, whenever and whenever it started to change everything, one day I was reading the story in Exodus and the Lord said, your prosperity is not for your pleasure. It's for my purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your prosperity is not for your pleasure. It's for my purpose. Now, I'm not saying that you can't ever have fun. I'm not saying you can't ever go to the beach. Lord knows I've been to the beach a few times. I'm trying to make a point. God's blessing on our life is for his purpose. Let's look at Exodus chapter 12 because this is what I was reading when it happened. It says in verse 35, the people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold, jewelry, and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked for. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. All this was for the tabernacle, the house of God. Why? So that the worship of God could go forth. The tabernacle, this is my words, is the house of God where the work of worship takes place and the whole congregation takes part and gives to the work. All right, here you go. Exodus 36, verses 1 through 7. Bezalel and Oheliab and every craftsman in whom the Lord has put skill and intelligence to know how to do any work in the construction of the sanctuary shall work in accordance with all that the Lord has commanded. And Moses called Bezalel and Oheliab and every craftsman in whose mind the Lord has put skill, everyone whose heart stirred him up to come to do the work. Thank you, Brother Luke, for your craftsmanship. Yeah. 
And they received from Moses all the contribution that the people of Israel had brought for doing the work on the sanctuary. They still kept bringing him free will offerings every morning so that all the craftsmen who were doing every sort of task on the sanctuary came each from the task that he was doing and said to Moses, the people bring much more than enough for doing the work that the Lord has commanded us to do. So Moses gave a command and word was proclaimed throughout the camp. Let no man or woman do anything more for the contribution for the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing for the material they had was sufficient to do all the work and more. Could you imagine a pastor saying, please don't give any more. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? But, but I mean, what a beautiful thing, though. The people of God partnering with God in his work. And his work was for the house of God, right? For his presence to be able to be there. Amen. And for the sacrifices that were being offered in worship and servitude of God's people as they worshiped him. Amen. Now I'm going to get into some deep stuff. Y'all ready to try to follow with me? It's the concept of the firstborn. It's a point because this is where the Levites come from. So I want you to see the heart of God because sometimes we don't study these types of scriptures, but I think it's important. And I believe that this is related to giving and it's related to tithing and it's related to the mind of God and the purposes of God. And it gives us a more clear revelation of what God desires from his people. I believe that. Okay. So here we go. Consecration of the firstborn in Exodus chapter 13. We'll read verses 1 and 2, and then we'll read some other verses. The Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. Verses 7 through 8. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you. No leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory. You shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. So, so let's just slow down a second. So if you read it through, it says every firstborn male that comes through the matrix or opens the uterus belongs to me. If it's a clean animal, you sacrifice it. If it's an unclean animal, like a donkey, you break its neck. Unless, if you need more donkeys than you need sheep at that point in time, because you need to plow your field, then you need to take a sheep and you need to offer it as a sacrifice, because a donkey's unclean and I don't accept unclean sacrifice. So if it's a firstborn donkey, you're going to break its neck, then like, I know Keita's already mad. Don't get that. I hear you. It's like, what is all the meaning of this? I'm going to tell you the meaning of this is what the Lord would say. That man has offended me and all this is my plan to bring man near to me. And it's all about sacrificial worship. And, and I am the creator of heaven and earth and all that in and this. And I gave Adam authority to name these animals. All right, let me like, I don't have to take God's defense. God's big enough to handle that himself. Amen. So you're going to break, you're going to offer up the firstborn, right? And he says, also in your male children. And he says, whenever your son starts to question this, Dad, Dad why do we do that? He also says it in the chapter before that for Passover. Every year you're going to do this Passover. And then your son's one day, your son's going to say this, Daddy, why do we do this? And you're going to tell him, because God delivered me out of Egypt. Now, let me ask you a question. I know you know this, but how did God deliver them out of Egypt? Through a lamb, through the blood of a lamb. You see, you can't make this stuff up. Take the lamb, paint its blood on the doorpost and the side post. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Deliverance through a lamb. The whole plan is about a lamb. The whole, everything is about a lamb. It's, it's all God's story and he's wanting us to get involved in the business of his kingdom of what he's doing. And he wants us to bring the lamb to others that they too might partake of what we've partaken of. And so sooner or later, your son's like, daddy, why do we keep offering up this Passover lamb every year? Because the Lord delivered us with a mighty hand out of Egypt. Daddy, why do we keep breaking that donkey's neck when it comes out? Why do we keep offering up that first year? Because the Lord delivered us with a mighty hand out of Egypt. I once was slaves and now I'm free. See, that's why we give back to God. Huh? 
Come on. Like whenever your heart, that see, that's why a lot of times people have a difficult time with giving and they have a difficult time with worship. If you stick with the Lord, though, he will bring you to the place where he can touch your heart and he can convince you that, no, you know what? He really is worthy. He's about to get his worship this morning, my friend. Oh, yeah, I'm about to show up and I'm about to give him my worship because he's worthy. Even though I might not feel like he's worthy because my emotions are getting in the way. Even though my mind might be tormented, even though I might not know where my child is today, or I don't know what's going on at the job tomorrow, I know this. He is faithful. He is true. He is deserving of glory and honor, and I'm going to worship him. Yes. Amen. And then in verses 11 through 14, the Lord, when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb, all the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a dog. Because you remember, God killed the firstborn of Egypt. It's a serious thing, my friend. I don't think that we understand how serious this is. Do you remember the story? Listen, this is not in my notes, but you got to bear with me because this is so important because we're in the last days. And it's so important that we be aroused. It's so important that we operate, we begin to walk under the fear and the reverence of the, of the Lord. Yes. And, and listen, the word fear is throughout the New Testament. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. First Peter chapter 1, at, at, as you're sojourning or you're a pilgrim on this journey, walk it out with fear. Reverence. That you're reverencing his word. That you're taking at his word. It, it's so important. And so what I wanted to tell you is this. Do y'all remember the story whenever God told Moses, go talk to old Pharaoh. And then Moses is coming back. And then it says, and, and it says, and the Lord went to kill him. And I went back and I'm like, who are you going to kill, Lord? Ain't nobody here but Moses. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to kill Moses. I'm going to kill Moses because you ain't circumcised your boy, son. That's it. See, I'm about to kill the firstborn of Egypt. You're denigrating my word. You're not treating me as holy. I am not hallowed in your heart. Y'all remember that story? And Zipporah says, she, she cuts that foreskin off and she throws it at Moses' feet and she says, a bloody husband you are to me because of this circumcision. I know that this ain't happening to nobody in here, but don't let your wife tell you how to serve the Lord. Don't let your husband tell you how to serve the Lord. I'm not saying don't be a submissive wife. I'm not saying don't be a husband that loves his wife more than Jesus loved the church. I'm saying don't let that man, don't let that woman, don't let your children get between you and Jesus because you don't want the Lord against you. Come on, somebody. You think the Lord ain't going to be against people that let other human beings any more than I need to let y'all get in between me and the Lord. Or you need to let me get in between you and the Lord. Your relationship with Jesus, he's like a treasure. He's a pearl of great price. He's a treasure hidden in the field. And now that you found him, you better protect him. Amen. And I'm just trying to say that it's, this is how serious this is. And this is what this is all about. The killing of the firstborn, the breaking of the neck, the annual Passover, all of these things are reminders to us that God is going to bring judgment. That's right. But he's so full of love and kindness and he loves us so much that he made a way for us. And he wants that love and compassion to be poured out on other people. Yes, and it says in, Exodus, in verses 15 through 16 of Exodus 13, for when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go. So he's telling his son this. The Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man, the firstborn of animals. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. Then he says this, it shall be as a mark on your hand or frontlets between your eyes, for by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. Look, I need to read that as a communion passage one time. I never saw that before. It shall be as a, a mark on your hand or frontless between your eyes that you're going to remember this. 
Every time you see this animal die, every time you see this Passover killed, it's a reminder that God delivered you. And every time you take communion and you see that broken body and you drink that blood of the new covenant, you are to be remembered that the firstborn of God would die for you so that you could be free and have eternal life. Let it be forever before your eyes. Let it be forever reminded in your heart the goodness that God has poured out on you. And that you don't have to be judged. Because your judgment was placed on Him. Now give Him His glory, His honor, and His due. Now give Him His reverence and His worship that is due His holy name. Amen. Now let's go to Numbers chapter 3. We're just going to read a little bit. We still got a little time. I know it's a lot of info. Thank you for your patience. How did he redeem the firstborn? The Lord said to Moses, list all the firstborn males of the people of Israel from a month old and upward, taking the number of their names, and you shall take the Levites from me. See, I'm trying to paint a picture for you. God's got a plan. He's got a plan for a tithe. He's got a plan for work. He's got a plan for a house of God. He's got a plan for a system of worship. The system of worship requires work. The work requires the, the offering of the sacrifice because it's the sacrifice that allows the day of atonement, right? I mean, the day of atonement. Without the blood poured out on the mercy seat once a year, the presence of God cannot be with the nation of Israel for the next year. Without the sacrifice of Jesus, you have no intimacy. Without the sacrifice of Jesus, you cannot approach him. Without the sacrifice of Jesus, there is no healing. There is no deliverance. Without the sacrifice of Jesus, there is no freedom. There is no liberty. Without the sacrifice of Jesus, there is no prosperity. Without the sacrifice of Jesus, we have nothing. Amen. Thank you, Lord. He said, you shall take the Levites for me. I am the Lord. Instead of all the firstborn among the people of Israel and the cattle of the Levites, instead of all the firstborn among the cattle of the people of Israel. So Moses listed all the firstborn among the people of Israel as the Lord commanded him. And all the firstborn males, according to the number of names from a month old and upward as listed, were 22,273. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the people of Israel and the cattle of the Levites instead of their cattle. The Levites shall be mine. I am the Lord. And as the redemption price for the 273 of the firstborn of the people of Israel over and above the number of the male Levites, you shall take five shekels per head. You shall take them according to the shekel of the sanctuary of 20 gerahs and give the money to Aaron and his sons as the redemption price for those who are over. So Moses took the redemption money from those who were over and above those redeemed by the Levites from the firstborn of the people of Israel. He took the money, 1,365 shekels by the shekel of the sanctuary. And Moses gave the redemption money to Aaron and his sons according to the word of the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. He said, they're mine. The Levites are mine. Count all the men and then count the Levites. You had 273 over the amount of Levites. Okay, multiply that by five. And now I need my 1,365 shekels of silver to redeem your firstborn males because I'm not going to take your, I'm going to take the Levites for me so that they can perform the services of the sanctuary and make sure that there is food in my house and to make sure that the sacrifices that are offered and to make sure that you are serving me and to make sure that I am receiving my worship. Amen? Leviticus 27, 30 through 34 says this, every tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees, look at this, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man, this is where Sister Tug got this from. If a man wishes to redeem some of his tithe, and the idea there is pretty much hold on to it for a while so he can work some work. He says if, if a man wishes to, I'm not telling you you got to live by this right here. I'm just telling you what, what was written here. Okay, it's, like I said, it's between you and the Lord. He shall add a fifth to it. Multiply 10% by, by a fifth, 
and add that to it when you do bring your offering to the Lord. All right, because it's not yours. <laughs> that that's what he's saying in the word. You, you, you know, I hope you're not being that's hard for me to read people's faces. Some people are small, some people are naked ass, some people are quiet. I feel like I'm not, I don't know if I'm putting y'all to sleep. I don't know if I'm making you mad. I don't know if you're bored because you just don't like the information. I'm not real sure what, what's going on, but I know I was fuming when, when that sister told me. I'm over there working in that pipe yard. I spilled Varsol on my leg and I got blisters up and down my leg. And you want me to give my money to the church? <laughs> I didn't know nothing. And like I told you, I woke up this morning and I went to the game. Do you believe me when I tell you that? I wish I would have gave more. Yes. Oh, thank you, sister. Because <laughs> I know I'm not the only one in here because y'all know how good God's been to y'all, man. Yes. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. Y'all know it's true. Praise God. All right. He says this, verse 31 of 27, if a man wishes to redeem some of his tithe out of fifth, and every tithe of the herds and flocks, every tenth animal of all that passes under the herds and staff shall be holy to the Lord. Isn't that something? I heard a preacher talk about this the other day that the rabbis wrote that, that one of the representative Levites would go out to the pastures and they'd have like a little gate where the sheep could run through one at a time. And he'd have like some kind of red ochre. They'd dip the stick in there and he'd be sitting on the fence. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, pop. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, pop. And they put that little red mark and all the ones that were red at the end belonged to the Lord. The Lord, go get my God. One shall not differentiate between good and bad because, the, the, see, the Lord knows what can be in our heart sometimes. No, we marked that one. Don't be trying to rub the red off and put it on that one that got a broke leg. Come on. Because <laughs> he said, because he goes on to say, he says this. He says, he says, because if you do that, if you try to make a substitute, then both it and the substitute shall be holy. And now they both belong to the Lord. So don't you be trying to see the Lord knows how to. That's one of the things that I've learned the hard way is this. He said, I will, he will sew your pockets up, my friend. <laughs> and I know that to be true. I didn't like, where is all this stuff going? He was trying to play games with the Lord, man. The Lord knows how to give what belongs to him. I'm trying to help. <laughs> some people, now listen, <laughs> granted, for some people, they're like, but, but I don't know, dude. I haven't really, there's a long time in my life I never really gave any money, and I got money in the bank, so you're not really talking. I get it. It might be a little bit more of a challenge for some people to believe that. But some people, y'all know what I'm talking about. You couldn't hold on to a nickel. And now when you started giving to the Lord, but I'm here to tell you that your part, your money is part of your worship. Amen. I, I believe this. All right. So we're getting close to the end. I believe. Here we go. Malachi chapter three. I wanted you to see this part about Jesus. So he's, he's actually prophesying. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Y'all knew that? Amen. And the last word that we get in the last book of the Old Testament is about the messenger. Look at this. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. Who's he talking about right there? John, John the Baptist. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire. He's like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Yes. He's going to make it all right. Because you see, by this time, Israel's is stealing from God. Oh, man, it's such a mess at this point in time, right? He's going to make it right. Now, look at this, though. Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 through 11. He says, for I, the Lord, do not change. You do know that, right? That, that the character of your, the God you serve is still as holy today as he was in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. and, and, you, and you do understand that because we're in a new covenant, we're experiences, experiencing his 
long suffering and his kindness and his mercy that he has poured out on us, the love that he has proven to us through his son, but that he's still as holy as what he ever was. And that's why the word fear is used in the New Testament to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling and during your sojourning here to walk it out in fear, to walk circumspectly before the Lord and understand that he gave us grace to walk right before him. Amen. I, I mean, that message is for me, my friend. Let us fall on our face and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your goodness and your grace towards me. Lord, please do a work in my heart that I be right with you. Amen. And we're all going to make a decision each and every day whether or not we believe that to be true. Whether or not we even care. I mean, I know most of y'all care because y'all showed up to church. And we're a pretty small group, so most of y'all care. I mean, there might be a couple of people in here. I don't know what you're feeling in your heart, but I know that I have sat in churches before where I really did not like what was being said because I wasn't right in my heart. And I don't, I don't mean that to be ugly. I'm just saying, like, that's where I was. That's where I was in my, in my little story of God. My heart was all twisted up. I was angry. I was frustrated. Maybe me and Danielle had gotten in a fight before church. Who knows what's going on in people's lives? Frustrated. You, you, you get what I'm saying? But at the same time, I need you to know that he's so good. Amen. That he's worthy for us to, to yield to him. Amen? Yes. All right. So he says this. Let me keep going. He's, verse 8, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you said, how have we robbed you in your tithes and contributions? <clears throat> you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Now, I want to make this point because I think that this is very profound in the past. I thought that that meant, I'm admitting to you, I thought that that meant, okay, there needs to be food in the house, the priest got to eat, the preacher got to eat, or whatever, you know, however you wanted to interpret that, I'm here to tell you, I don't believe that to be the case anymore, and I'm about to show you, he says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, now this is the beauty of it, because he will bless you, don't turn your giving into covetousness. Don't turn your giving as a child of God into a spiritual lottery. All right? I'm not saying anybody's ever done that. But don't say, I'm going to give. And listen, it's wrong to say, man, dude, I, I think that, 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 listen, I've done this before. When I gave to this, I got more in return. We need to be careful with that. I'm just saying you need to determine whether or not you believe in and what you're giving to, and whether or not, because see, there's a difference between a tithe and an offering too. You got free will offerings in, in addition to tithing, and you don't have to give free will offerings. The Lord allowed, that's your free will. You can choose whether you're gonna do that or not. And praise God, through most of my years, we've given free will offerings. But the tithe is connected to the house of the Lord. And I want to make it clear. It's not about where you get fed. It's about whether or not the Lord is getting fed. Now, let me just say this about that. If you don't feel like you're getting fed or you don't feel like the place where you are is doing the work of the Lord, you, I mean, does that sound, does it sound wrong to say this? You probably shouldn't be there. That's right. And I'm not, I mean, sometimes I look at, I want to say this too. Sometimes y'all, I look at y'all for a long time. It's because I look for faces that look nice. Okay. I just want y'all to know that. I don't want anybody to think I'm preaching to anybody. I'm, sometimes I just look for nice people. Okay. Praise God. I want y'all to understand that. So I don't look at you. No, that doesn't mean that either. Oh, Lord. Thank you for saying that. It doesn't mean that either. What if I don't look at you that you, you don't look nice? Oh, man. I get myself in so much. I just know that there's all kind of stuff going on in people's head. I know I shouldn't worry about that. My sister told me 15 years ago, Matt quit it. Jeremiah, he told Jeremiah, don't look at their faces. I'm like, okay. I'm going to do like Whitfield. And I'm just going to read it. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Praise God at the end, they were all weeping. Amen. All right. 
bring the full to, okay. Thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. He's going to take care of your vine. He's going to take care of your field. He's going to take care of your crops. He's going to take care of your animals. He's going to take care of your vehicles. Hallelujah, man. As long as you're working with him and you don't do like drive like me, like I come on, man, I used to drive crazy. And if your temperature gauge says hot, you're supposed to stop. <laughs> I'm talking on myself right now. All right, whose house is it? Whose food is it? Look at this, Numbers 28, verses 1 and 2. This is where I'm trying to get to you right here. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, command the people of Israel Say to them, my offering, my food, for my offerings, my pleasing aroma, you shall be careful to offer to me at its appointed time. In chapter 29, four times he said pleasing aroma. He said on the first day of this, this is verse 6. On the first day of the seventh month, you shall blow the trumpet. You shall do no servile work and you shall offer a burnt offering as a pleasing aroma. Verse, verse six, besides the burnt offering of the new moon and his grain offering and the regular burnt offering and his grain offering and their drink offering according to the rule for them for a pleasing aroma a food offering to the Lord. On the 15th day of the month, you shall offer a burnt offering, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. 13 bulls from the herd, two rams, 14 male lambs, a year old. They shall be without blemish. On the eighth day, you shall have a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work, but you shall offer a burnt offering, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. One bull, one ram. Seven male lambs a year old without blemish. I want to remind you what he said in Numbers 28, verse 1. Verse 2, command the people of Israel, say to them, my offering, my food for my food offerings, my pleasing aroma, you shall be careful to offer to me at this appointed time. You should really, to be honest with you, and I don't mean this for you to like me. I'm saying you should be appreciative to hear a message like this because this right now should be clarifying the Old Testament. This right now should be bringing much clarity about the Old Testament for you. And what is the what seems to be senseless offerings, we're not senseless at all. Not to the heart of God. Because see, to the heart of God every time, and I know I've already preached it last week or the week before, but I'm going to preach it again. Because according to the heart of God, every time he smelled that, smelled that sweet smelling aroma, what did it remind him of? A body. All these days, all these ages, all these years, a body you have prepared for. Let Lord help us in this modern church world. If deliverance becomes bigger than the deliverer, if healing comes bigger than the healer, come on. Lord help us. Help us to keep our mind focused on the eternal Lamb of God. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. All right, I'm about to close. Let's close out with Hebrews chapter 7, verses 23 through 28. It says in verse 23, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently. The writer of Hebrews, I believe it's the Apostle Paul, is trying to convince Christians that are going backwards into sacrificial worship. And he's trying to convince them, man, you're leaving Jesus, who's the fulfillment of all of this, and you're going back to something that's not, that's not going to give you, it's, it, it's, you know, you're turning your back on God. So look at that. But he holds his priesthood permanently. Because he continues forever. See, that was the whole reason of connecting him to Melchizedek to make that point. 
Consequently, he is able to save the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him. It's so important. The Lord's really been putting it in my heart lately. It's so important, and I know I keep saying it, that we understand I'm concerned that there's churches that are filled with people that, that have never truly been converted. Come on. That doesn't mean you're never going to have a bad day after you give your heart to the Lord. As a matter of fact, you might have bad years. Yeah. But what I'm trying to say is, is that when you do get converted and the Holy Spirit moves into your heart, you should know it because he starts to deal with you. And the, what the dealing is about, listen, this is important. The dealing is about the struggle between your will and his will. Yes. Yeah. The ongoing struggle between your will and his will. And when you're saying, no, God, not your will be done, but my will be done. That's what causes the conflict. And that's why we must die. Yes. Right? That's, and, it's, and, it, and it hurts to die. Especially when one little piece at a time is being cut off. Amen. Does that make sense? Amen. But, but that's the gospel. Amen. The gospel says we have to yield to his work. We have to yield and let him wield. Wield the scalpel that yes. does the circumcision. Right? Okay. He's able to save those to the uttermost since he always lives to make intercession for them. Well, that's beautiful. Amen. He's always living to make intercession for you. You're never alone. Jesus was alone when he hung on the cross, but you're not alone. Amen. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. Music ministry, y'all can come forward if you don't mind. Verse 27. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily for his own sins and then for those of the people since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law points men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath which came later than the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. So the point to the message was this, is that the tithe belongs to the Lord, the tithe is for the house of God, the tithe is for the work of God. The work of God is the sacrifice of the Lamb. The work of God, is, the, the work of the people is that they would serve Him. They serve Him through worship. Our worship is connected to the Lamb. It was connected to the Lamb, the sacrificial offerings in the Old Testament, is connected to the Lamb today. They worship looking forward to Him. He has now done the work of fulfillment. The purpose of the house of God is that we would congregate together and that we would give our worship to the Lamb who came and made the way for us. Amen? And so when we do worship through giving, what we need to understand is, is that we're giving for the house of God because God does believe in a congregation. If God didn't believe in a congregation, he wouldn't have a congregation in Israel, and he wouldn't have talked about the church in the New Testament. Amen? And, 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 and you know, we could get into all of that because people, people do various things in their head, but praise God for a place to worship the Lord. Amen? And it's important that we can come together and have a place to worship the Lord. I believe that. Amen? And so anyway, I just want to thank everybody. For your faithfulness and uh let's let's just go out worshiping the lord amen praise god thank you jesus we give you glory thank you father for sending us your son thank you for making a way we desire to worship you with our hearts lord with our giving lord we worship you this morning with our hearts and our giving lord we give to you because you gave to us had you not given us your son, we wouldn't even know you. We'd still be lost in a pit of darkness. But you saved us. You rescued us. You're worthy this morning to receive your honor. We give you honor. Oh, eternal Lamb of God, we give you honor this morning. Thank you, Jesus.